One of the not-so-subtle reminders I give participants at my seminar is this. Whenever you feel as if you've got a big problem, point to yourself and scream, Mini-me! 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 That will abruptly wake you up and move your attention back to where it belongs, on yourself. Then, coming from your higher self, rather than your ego-based victim self, take a deep breath and decide right now, in this very moment, you will be a bigger person and not allow any problem or obstacle to take you out of either your happiness or success. The bigger the problems you can handle, the bigger the business you can handle. The bigger the responsibility you can handle, the more employees you can handle. The more customers you can handle, the more money you can handle. And ultimately, the more wealth you can handle. Again, your wealth can only grow to the extent that you do. The objective is to grow yourself to a place where you can overcome any problems or obstacles that get in the way of your creating wealth and keeping it once you have it. By the way, keeping your wealth is a whole other world. Who knew? I sure didn't. I thought that once you made it, you made it. Boy, was I in for a rude awakening as I proceeded to lose my first million almost as fast as I made it. Now, in hindsight, I understand what the issue was. At the time, my toolbox wasn't yet big and strong enough to hold the wealth I had achieved. Again, thank goodness I practiced the principles of the millionaire mind and was able to recondition myself. Not only did I make that million back, but because of my new money blueprint, I've made millions and millions more. Best of all, I've not only kept it, but it keeps growing at a phenomenal rate. Think of yourself as your container for wealth. If your container is small and your money is big, what's going to happen? You will lose it. Your container will overflow and the excess money will spill out all over the place. You simply cannot have more money than the container. Therefore, you must grow to be a big container so you cannot only hold more wealth but also attract more wealth. The universe abhors a vacuum and if you have a very large money container, it will rush in to fill the space. One of the reasons rich people are bigger than their problems goes back to what we discussed earlier. They don't focus on the problem. They focus on their goal. Again, the mind generally focuses on one predominant thing at a time, meaning that either you are whining about the problem or you are working on the solution. Rich and successful people are solution-oriented. They spend their time and energy strategizing and planning the answers to challenges that come up and creating systems to make certain that problem doesn't occur again. Poor and unsuccessful people are problem-oriented. They spend their time and energy bitching and complaining and seldom come up with anything creative to alleviate the problem, let alone make sure it doesn't happen again. Rich people do not back away from problems, do not avoid problems, and do not complain about problems. Rich people are financial warriors. In our Enlightened Warrior Training Camp, the definition of a warrior we use is one who conquers oneself. The bottom line is that if you become a master at handling problems and overcoming any obstacle, what can stop you from success? The answer is nothing. And if nothing can stop you, you become unstoppable. And if you become unstoppable, what choices do you have in your life? The answer is all choices. If you are unstoppable, anything and everything is available to you. You simply choose it, and it's yours. How's that for freedom? Declarations. Place your hand on your heart and say, I am bigger than any problems. I can handle any problems. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire mind actions. 1. Whenever you are feeling upset over a big problem, point to yourself and say, Mini me, mini me. Then, take a deep breath and say to yourself, I can handle this. I am bigger than any problem. 2. Write down a problem you are having in your life. Then list 10 specific actions you can take to resolve or at least improve this situation. This will move you from problem thinking into solution thinking. First, there's a good chance you'll solve the problem. Second, you'll feel a heck of a lot better. Wealth File Number 10 Rich people are excellent receivers. Poor people are poor receivers. If I had to nail down the number one reason most people do not reach their full financial potential, 
it would be this. Most people are poor receivers. They may or may not be good at giving, but they are definitely bad at receiving. And because they are poor at receiving, they don't. People are challenged by receiving for several reasons. First, many people feel unworthy or undeserving. This syndrome runs rampant in our society. I would guess that over 90% of individuals have feelings of not being good enough running through their veins. Where does this low self-esteem come from? The usual, our conditioning. For most of us, it comes from hearing 20 no's for every yes, 10 you're doing it wrongs for every you're doing it right, and 5 you're stupids for every you're awesome. Even if our parents or guardians were incredibly supportive, many of us end up with feelings of not being able to continually measure up to their accolades and expectations. So once again, we're not good enough. In addition, most of us grew up with the element of punishment in our lives. This unwritten rule simply states that if you do something wrong, you will or should be punished. Some of us were punished by our parents, some of us by our teachers, and some of us in certain religious circles were threatened with the mother of all punishments, not getting into heaven. Of course, now that we're adults, all this is over, right? Wrong. For most people, the conditioning of punishment is so ingrained that because there is no one around to punish them, when they make a mistake or just aren't perfect, they subconsciously punish themselves. When they were young, this punishment might have come in the form of, you were bad, so no candy. Today, however, it could take the form of, you were bad, so no money. This explains why some people limit their earnings and why others will subconsciously sabotage their success. No wonder people have difficulty receiving. One tiny mistake, and you're doomed to carry the burden of misery and poverty for the rest of your life. A little harsh, you say? Since when did the mind become logical or compassionate? Again, the conditioned mind is a file folder filled with past programming, made-up meanings, and stories of drama and disaster. Making sense is not its strong suit. Here's something I teach in my seminars that might make you feel better. In the end, it doesn't matter whether you feel worthy or not. You can be rich either way. Plenty of wealthy people don't feel overly worthy. In fact, it's one of the major motivations for people to get rich. To prove themselves and their worth to themselves and to others. The idea that self-worth is necessary for net worth is just that, an idea. But it doesn't necessarily hold water in the real world. As we said earlier, getting rich to prove yourself may not make you the happiest camper, so you're better off creating wealth for other reasons. But what's important here is for you to realize that your feeling of unworthiness won't prevent you from getting rich. From a strictly financial point of view, this could actually be a motivational asset. Having said that, I want you to get what I'm going to share with you loud and clear. This could easily be one of the most important moments in your life. Are you ready? Here goes. Recognize that whether you are worthy or not is all a made-up story. Again, nothing has meaning except for the meaning we give it. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of anybody who went through the stamping lineup at birth. Can you imagine God stamping each person's forehead as he or she came through? Worthy, unworthy, worthy, worthy, unworthy. Yuck definitely unworthy. Sorry, I don't think it works that way. There's no one who comes around and stamps you worthy or unworthy. You do that. You make it up. You decide it. You and you alone determine if you're going to be worthy. It's simply your perspective. If you say you're worthy, you are. Again, energy is contagious. Darkness dissipates in light. People actually have to work hard to stay dark when light is all around them. Your job is simply to be the best you can be. If they choose to ask you your secret, tell them. Second, keep in mind another principle that we feature in our wizard training, which is, of course, about manifesting what you want while staying calm, centered, and peaceful. It states, everything happens for a reason, and that reason is there to assist me. Yes, it's much more difficult to be positive and conscious around people and circumstances that are negative, but that's your test. Just as steel is hardened in the fire, 
If you can remain true to your values while others around you are full of doubt and even condemnation, you'll grow faster and stronger. Also remember that nothing has meaning except for the meaning we give it. Recall in part one of this book, we discussed how we usually end up identifying with or rebelling against one or both of our parents, depending on how we framed their actions. From now on, I want you to practice reframing other people's negativity as a reminder of how not to be. The more negative they are, the more reminders you have about how ugly that way of being really is. I'm not suggesting you tell them this. Just do it without condemning them for how they are. For if you do begin to judge, criticize, and put them down for who they are and what they do, then you are no better than them. Worst comes to worst, if you just can't handle their non-supportive energy anymore, if it's bringing you down to a point where you're not able to grow, you may have to make some courageous decisions about who you are and how you want to live the rest of your life. I'm not suggesting you do anything rash, but I, for one, would never live with a person who was negative and poo-pooed my desire to learn and grow, be it personally, spiritually, or financially. I wouldn't do that to myself because I respect myself and my life, and I deserve to be as happy and successful as possible. The way I figure it, there are over 6.3 billion people in the world, and there's no way I'm going to saddle myself with a downer. Either they move up, or I move on. Again, energy is contagious. Either you affect people, or infect people. The same holds true the opposite way around. Either people affect or infect you. Let me ask you a question. Would you hug and hold a person you knew had a severe case of the measles? Most people would say, no way, I don't want to catch the measles. Well, I believe negative thinking is like having measles of the mind. Instead of itching, you get bitching. Instead of scratching, you get bashing. Instead of irritation, you get frustration. Now, do you really want to be close to people like that? I'm sure you've heard the saying, birds of a feather flock together. Did you know that most people earn within 20% of the average income of their closest friends? That's why you'd better watch whom you associate with and choose whom you spend your time with carefully. From my experience, rich people don't just join the country club to play golf. They join to connect with other rich and successful people. There's another saying that goes, it's not what you know, it's who you know. As far as I'm concerned, you can take that to the bank. In short, if you want to fly with the eagles, don't swim with the ducks. I make it a point to only associate with successful, positive people, and just as importantly, I disassociate from negative ones. I also make it a point to remove myself from toxic situations. I see no reason for infecting myself with poisonous energy. Among these, I would include arguing, gossiping, and backstabbing. I would also include watching mindless television, unless you use it specifically as a relaxation strategy instead of your sole form of entertainment. When I watch TV, it's usually sports. First, because I enjoy seeing masters at anything at work, or in this case, play. And second, because I enjoy listening to the interviews after the games. I love listening to the mindset of champions, and to me, Anyone who has made it as far as the big leagues in any sport is a champion. Any athlete at that level has outcompeted tens of thousands of other players to get there at all, which makes each of them incredible to me. I love hearing their attitude when they win. It was a great effort from the entire team. We did well, but we still have improvements to make. It goes to show you that hard work pays off. I also love listening to their attitude when they lose. It's only one game. We'll be back. We're just going to forget about this one and put our focus on the next game. We'll go back and talk about where we can do better, and then do whatever it takes to win. During the 2004 Olympic Games, Perdita Felicien, a Canadian and the reigning world champion in the 100-meter hurdles, was heavily favored to win the gold medal. In the final race, she hit the first hurdle and fell hard. She wasn't able to complete the race. Extremely upset, she had tears in her eyes as she lay there in bewilderment. She had prepared for this moment six hours a day, every day of the week, for the past four years. The next morning, I saw her news conference. I wish I had taped it. It was amazing to listen to her perspective. She said something to the effect of, 
I don't know why it happened, but it did, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to focus even more and work even harder for the next four years. Who knows what my path would have been had I won. Maybe it would have dulled my desire. I don't know. But I do know that now I'm hungrier than ever. I'll be back even stronger. As I heard her speak, all I could say was, wow. You can learn a lot from listening to champions. Rich people hang around with winners. Poor people hang around with losers. Why? It's a matter of comfort. Rich people are comfortable with other successful people. They feel fully worthy of being with them. Poor people are uncomfortable with highly successful people. They're either afraid they'll be rejected or feel as if they don't belong. To protect itself, the ego then goes into judgment and criticism. If you want to get rich, you will have to change your inner blueprint to fully believe you are every bit as good as any millionaire or multimillionaire out there. I'm shocked in my seminars when people come up to me and ask if they can touch me. They say, I've never touched a multimillionaire before. I'm usually polite and smile, but in my mind I'm saying, get a frickin' life. I'm no better or different from you, and unless you start to understand that, you'll stay broke forever. My friends, it's not about touching millionaires. It's about deciding that you are just as good and worthy as they are, and then acting like it. My best advice is this. If you really want to touch a millionaire, become one. I hope you get the point. Instead of mocking rich people, model them. Instead of shying away from rich people, get to know them. Instead of saying, wow, they're so special, say, if they can do it, I can do it. Eventually, if you want to touch a millionaire, you'll be able to touch yourself. Declarations. Place your hand on your heart and say, I model rich and successful people. I associate with rich and successful people. If they can do it, I can do it. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire Mind Actions 1. Go to the library, a bookstore, or the internet and read a biography of someone who is or was extremely rich and successful. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Mary Kay, Donald Trump, Warren Buffett, Jack Welch, Bill Gates, and Ted Turner are some good examples. Use their story for inspiration, for learning specific success strategies, and most importantly, for copying their mindset. 2. Join a high-end club, such as for tennis, health, business, or golf. Mingle with rich people in a rich environment. Or, if there's no way you can afford to join a high-end club, have coffee or tea in the classiest hotel in your city. Get comfortable in this atmosphere and watch the patrons, noticing they're no different from you. 3. Identify a situation or a person who is a downer in your life. Remove yourself from that situation or association. If it's family, choose to be around them less. 4. Stop watching trash TV and stay away from bad news. Wealth file number 8. Rich people are willing to promote themselves and their value. Poor people think negatively about selling and promotion. Peak Potentials Training, one of the companies licensed with my programs, offers over a dozen different programs. During the initial seminar, usually the Millionaire Mind Intensive, they briefly mention a few of our other courses, then offer the participants special at-seminar tuition rates and bonuses. Most people are thrilled. They appreciate getting to hear what the other courses are about and to receive the special pricing. Some people, however, are not so thrilled. They resent any promotion regardless of how it might benefit them. If this sounds in any way like you, it's an important characteristic to notice about yourself. Resenting promotion is one of the greatest obstacles to success. People who have issues with selling and promotion are usually broke. It's obvious. How can you create a large income in your own business or as a representative of one if you aren't willing to let other people know that you, your product or your service exists? Even as an employee, if you aren't willing to promote your virtues, someone who is willing will quickly bypass you on the corporate ladder. People have a problem with promotion or sales for several reasons. Chances are you might recognize one or more of the following. Millionaire Mind Actions 1. 
Get in the game. Consider a situation or project you've wanted to start. Whatever you've been waiting for, forget it. Begin now from wherever you are with whatever you've got. If possible, do it while working for or with someone else, first to learn the ropes. If you've already learned, no more excuses. Go for it. 2. Practice optimism. Today, whatever anyone says is a problem or an obstacle, reframe it into an opportunity. You'll drive negative people nuts, but hey, what's the difference? That's what they're constantly doing to themselves anyway. 3. Focus on what you have, not on what you don't have. Make a list of 10 things you are grateful for in your life and read the list aloud. Then read it each morning for the next 30 days. If you don't appreciate what you've got, you won't get any more and you don't need any more. Wealth file number six. Rich people admire other rich and successful people. Poor people resent rich and successful people. Poor people often look at other people's success with resentment, jealousy, and envy. Or they snip, they're so lucky, or whisper under their breath, those rich jerks. You have to realize that if you view rich people as bad in any way, shape, or form, and you want to be a good person, then you can never be rich. It's impossible. How can you be something you despise? It's amazing to witness the resentment and even outright anger that many poor people have toward the rich. As if they believe that rich people make them poor. Yep, that's right. Rich people took all the money so there's none left for me. Of course, this is perfect victim talk. I want to tell you a story. Not to complain, but simply to relate a real-world experience I had with this principle. In the old days, when I was, let's say, financially challenged, I used to drive a clunker. Changing lanes in traffic was never a problem. Almost everybody would let me in. But when I got rich and bought a gorgeous new black Jaguar, I couldn't help but notice how things changed. All of a sudden, I started getting cut off and sometimes given the finger for added measure. I even got things thrown at me, all for one reason. I drove a Jag. One day, I was driving through a lower-end neighborhood in San Diego, delivering turkeys for a charity at Christmas time. I had the sunroof open and noticed four grimy guys perched in the back of a pickup truck behind me. Out of nowhere, they started playing basketball with my car by attempting to shoot beer cans into my open sunroof. Five dents and several deep scratches later, they passed me screaming, You rich bastard! Of course, I figured this to be an isolated incident until just two weeks later, in a different lower-end neighborhood, I parked my car on the street and returned to it less than ten minutes later to discover the entire side of my car had been keyed. The next time I went to that area of town, I rented a Ford Escort and, amazingly, I didn't have a single problem. I'm not implying that poorer neighborhoods have bad people, but in my experience, they sure seem to have plenty of folks who resent the rich. Who knows, maybe it's some kind of chicken and egg thing. Is it because they're broke that they resent the rich? or because they resent rich people that they're broke. As far as I'm concerned, who cares? It's all the same, they're still poor. It's easy to talk about not resenting the rich, but depending on your mood, falling into the trap can happen to anyone, even me. Recently, I was eating dinner in my hotel room about an hour before going on stage to teach an evening session of the Millionaire Mind Seminar. I turned on the tube to check the sports scores and found that Oprah was on. Although I'm not a big fan of television, I love Oprah. That woman has affected more people in a positive way than almost anyone else on the planet. And consequently, she deserves every penny she's got, and more. Meanwhile, she's interviewing actress Halle Berry. They're discussing how Halle has just received one of the largest film contracts in history for a female actor. Twenty million dollars. Halle then says that she doesn't care about the money, and that she fought for this humongous contract to blaze a trail for other women to follow. I heard myself say skeptically, Yeah, right. Do you think I and everyone else watching this show is an idiot? You should take a hunk of that dough and give your public relations agent a raise. That's the best soundbite writing I've ever heard. I felt the negativity welling up inside me. And just in the nick of time, I caught myself before the energy took me over. Cancel, cancel, thank you for sharing, I yelled out loud to my mind to drown out that voice of resentment. I couldn't believe it. Here I was, Mr. Millionaire Mind himself, actually resenting Halle Berry for the money she made. 
I quickly turned it around and began screaming at the top of my lungs, Way to go, girl! You rock! You let them off too cheap. You should have got $30 million. Good for you. You're incredible and you deserve it. I felt a lot better. Regardless of her reason for wanting all that money, the problem wasn't her, it was me. Remember, my opinions make no difference to Hallie's happiness or wealth, but they do make a difference to my happiness and wealth. Also remember that thoughts and opinions aren't good or bad, right or wrong as they enter your mind, but they can sure be empowering or disempowering to your happiness and success as they enter your life. The moment I felt that negative energy run through me, my observation alarms went off, and as I've trained myself to do, I immediately neutralized the negativity in my mind. You don't have to be perfect to get rich, but you do need to recognize when your thinking isn't empowering yourself or others. Then quickly refocus on more supportive thoughts. The more you study this book, the faster and easier this process will be. And if you attend the Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar, you will dramatically accelerate your progress. I know I keep mentioning the Millionaire Mind course, but please understand. I wouldn't be so adamant about this program if I didn't see for myself the phenomenal results people get in their lives. In their outstanding book, The One Minute Millionaire, my good friends Mark Victor Hansen and Robert Allen quote the poignant story of Russell H. Conwell in his book, Acres of Diamonds, which was written over a hundred years ago. I say that you ought to get rich, and it is your duty to get rich. How many of my pious brethren say to me, do you, a Christian minister, spend your time going up and down the country advising young people to get rich, to get money? Yes, of course I do. They say, isn't that awful? Why don't you preach the gospel instead of preaching about man's making money? Because to make money honestly is to preach the gospel. That is the reason. The men who get rich may be the most honest men you find in the community. Oh, but says some young man here tonight, I have been told all my life that if a person has money, he is very dishonest and dishonorable and mean and contemptible. My friend, that is the reason you have none, because you have that idea of people. The foundation of your faith is altogether false. Let me say clearly, 98 out of 100 of the rich men and women of America are honest. That is why they are rich. That is why they are trusted with money. That is why they carry on great enterprises and find plenty of people to work with them. Says another young man, I hear sometimes of men that get millions of dollars dishonestly. Yes, of course you do, and so do I. But they are so rare a thing, in fact, that the newspapers talk about them all the time as a matter of news until you get the idea that all the other rich men got rich dishonestly. My friend, you drive me out into the suburbs of Philadelphia and introduce me to the people who own their homes around this great city. So beautiful homes with gardens and flowers. Those magnificent homes so lovely in their art. And I will introduce you to the very best people in character as well as in enterprise in our city. They that own their homes are made more honorable and honest and pure, and true and economical and careful by owning them. We preach against covetousness in the pulpit and use the terms filthy lucre so extremely that Christians get the idea that it is wicked for any man to have money. Money is power, and you ought to be reasonably ambitious to have it. You ought because you can do more good with it than you can without it. Money printed your Bibles. Money builds your churches. Money sends your missionaries, and money pays your preachers. I say then, you ought to have money. If you can honestly attain unto riches, it is your godly duty to do so. It is an awful mistake of these pious people to think you must be awfully poor in order to be pious. Cornwell's passage makes several excellent points. The first refers to the ability to be trusted. Of all the attributes necessary for getting rich, having others trust you has to be near the top of the list. Well, think about it. Would you do business with a person you didn't trust, at least to some extent? No way. Meaning that to get rich, there is a good chance many, many, many people must trust you. And there's a good chance that for that many people to trust you, you have to be quite trustworthy. What other traits does a person need to get rich and, even more importantly, stay rich? No doubt there are always exceptions to any rule, but for the most part, who do you have to be to succeed at anything? Try some of these characteristics on for size. Positive, reliable, focused, determined, persistent, 
hard-working, energetic, good with people, a competent communicator, semi-intelligent, and an expert in at least one area. Another interesting element in Conwell's passage is that so many people have been conditioned to believe that you can't be rich and a good person or rich and spiritual. I too used to think this way. Like many of us, I was told by friends, teachers, media, and the rest of society that rich people were somehow bad, that they were all greedy. Once again, another way of thinking that ended up being pure crapola. Backed by my own real-world experience rather than old, fear-based myth, I found that the richest people I know are also the nicest. When I moved to San Diego, we moved into a home in one of the richest parts of town. We loved the beauty of the home and the area. But I had some trepidation because I didn't know anyone and felt I didn't yet fit in. My plan was to stay low-key and not mix much with these rich snobs. As the universe would have it, however, my kids, who were five and seven years old at the time, made friends with the other kids in the neighborhood, and pretty soon I was driving them to these mansions to drop them off to play. First, you may have had a bad experience in the past with people promoting to you inappropriately. Maybe you perceived they were doing the hard sell on you. Maybe they were bothering you at an inopportune time. Maybe they wouldn't take no for an answer. In any case, it's important to recognize that this experience is in the past and that holding on to it may not be serving you today. Second, you may have had a disempowering experience when you tried to sell something to someone and that person totally rejected you. In this instance, your distaste for promotion is merely a projection of your own fear of failure and rejection. Again, realize that the past does not necessarily equal the future. Third, your issue might come from past parental programming. Many of us were told that it's impolite to toot your own horn. Well, that's great if you make a living as Miss Manners, but in the real world when it comes to business and money, if you don't toot your horn, I guarantee nobody will. Rich people are willing to extol their virtues and value to anyone who will listen and hopefully do business with them as well. Finally, some people feel that promotion is beneath them. I call this the high and mighty syndrome, otherwise known as the aren't I so special attitude. The feeling in this case is that if people want what you have, they should somehow find and come to you. People who have this belief are either broke or soon will be, that's for sure. They can hope that everyone's going to scour the land searching for them, but the truth is that the marketplace is crowded with products and services, and even though theirs may be the best, no one will ever know that because they're too snooty to tell anyone. You're probably familiar with the saying, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Well, that's only true if you add five words, if they know about it. Rich people are almost always excellent promoters. They can and are willing to promote their products, their services, and their ideas with passion and enthusiasm. What's more, they're skilled at packaging their value in a way that's extremely attractive. If you think there's something wrong with that, then let's ban makeup for women. And while we're at it, we might as well get rid of suits for men. All that is nothing more than packaging. Robert Kiyosaki, best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a book I highly recommend, points out that every business, including writing books, depends on selling. He notes that he is recognized as a best-selling author, not a best-writing author. One pays a lot more than the other. Rich people are usually leaders, and all great leaders are great promoters. To be a leader, you must inherently have followers and supporters, which means that you have to be adept at selling, inspiring, and motivating people to buy into your vision. Even the President of the United States of America has to continuously sell his ideas to the people, to Congress, and even to his own party to have them implemented. And way before all of that takes place, if he doesn't sell himself in the first place, he'll never even get elected. In short, any leader who can't or won't promote will not be a leader for long, be it in politics, business, sports, or even as a parent. I'm harping on this because leaders earn a heck of a lot more money than followers. The critical point here isn't whether you like to promote or not. It is why you're promoting. It boils down to your beliefs. Do you really believe in your value? Do you really believe in the product or service you're offering? Do you really believe that what you have will be of benefit to whomever you're promoting it to? If you believe in your value, 
how could it possibly be appropriate to hide it from people who need it? Suppose you had a cure for arthritis, and you met someone who was suffering and in pain with the disease. Would you hide it from him or her? Would you wait for that person to read your mind or guess that you have a product that could help? What would you think of someone who didn't offer suffering people their opportunity because they were too shy, too afraid, or too cool to promote? More often than not, people who have a problem with promotion don't fully believe in their product or don't fully believe in themselves. Consequently, it's difficult for them to imagine that other people believe so strongly in their value that they want to share it with everyone who comes their way and in any way they can. If you believe that what you have to offer can truly assist people, it's your duty to let as many people as possible know about it. In this way, you not only help people, you get rich. Declaration. Place your hand on your heart and say, I promote my value to others with passion and enthusiasm. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire mind actions. One, rate the product or service you are currently offering or you are planning to offer from one to 10 in terms of how much you believe in its value. One being the lowest, 10 being the highest. If your rating result is seven to nine, revise your product or service to increase the value. If your result is six or below, stop offering that product or service and start representing something you truly believe in. Two, read books, listen to audios and CDs, and take courses on marketing and sales. Become an expert in both of these arenas to the point where you can promote your value successfully and with 100% integrity. Wealth file number nine. Rich people are bigger than their problems. Poor people are smaller than their problems. As I said earlier, getting rich is not a stroll in the park. It is a journey that is full of twists, turns, detours, and obstacles. The road to wealth is fraught with traps and pitfalls, and that's precisely why most people don't take it. They don't want the hassles, the headaches, and the responsibilities. In short, they don't want the problems. Therein lies one of the biggest differences between rich people and poor people. Rich and successful people are bigger than their problems, while poor and unsuccessful people are smaller than their problems. Poor people will do almost anything to avoid problems. They see a challenge and they run. The irony is that in their quest to make sure they don't have problems, they have the biggest problem of all. They're broke and miserable. The secret to success, my friends, is not to try to avoid or get rid of or shrink from your problems. The secret is to grow yourself so that you are bigger than any problem. On a scale of one to 10, one being the lowest, imagine you are a person with a level two strength of character and attitude looking at a level five problem. Would this problem appear to be big or little? From a level two perspective, a level five problem would seem like a big problem. Now imagine you've grown yourself and become a level 8 person. Would the same level 5 problem be a big problem or a little problem? Magically, the identical problem is now a little problem. Finally, imagine you've really worked hard on yourself and become a level 10 person. Now, is this same level 5 problem a big problem or a little problem? The answer is that it's no problem. It doesn't even register in your brain as a problem. There's no negative energy around it. It's just a normal occurrence to handle, like brushing your teeth or getting dressed. Note that whether you are rich or poor, playing big or playing small, problems do not go away. If you're breathing, you will always have so-called problems and obstacles in your life. Let me make this short and sweet. The size of the problem is never the issue. What matters is the size of you. This may be painful, but if you're ready to move to the next level of success, you're going to have to become conscious of what's really going on in your life. Ready? Here goes. If you have a big problem in your life, all that means is that you are being a small person. Don't be fooled by appearances. Your outer world is merely a reflection of your inner world. If you want to make a permanent change, stop focusing on the size of your problems and start focusing on the size of you. We're not talking about positive thinking here. We're talking about your habitual perspective on the world. Poor people make choices based upon fear. 
Their minds are constantly scanning for what is wrong or could go wrong in any situation. Their primary mindset is, what if it doesn't work? Or more often, it won't work. Middle class people are slightly more optimistic. Their mindset is, I sure hope this works. Rich people, as we've said earlier, take responsibility for the results in their lives and act upon the mindset, it will work because I'll make it work. Rich people expect to succeed. They have confidence in their abilities, they have confidence in their creativity, and they believe that should the doo-doo hit the fan, they can find another way to succeed. Generally speaking, the higher the reward, the higher the risk. Because they constantly see opportunity, rich people are willing to take a risk. Rich people believe that if worse comes to worst, they can always make their money back. Poor people, on the other hand, expect to fail. They lack confidence in themselves and in their abilities. Poor people believe that should things not work out, it would be catastrophic. And because they constantly see obstacles, they are usually unwilling to take a risk. No risk, no reward. For the record, being willing to risk doesn't necessarily mean that you are willing to lose. Rich people take educated risks. This means that they research, do their due diligence, and make decisions based on solid information and facts. Do rich people take forever to get educated? No. They do what they can in as short a time as possible, then make an informed decision to go for it or not. Although poor people claim to be preparing for an opportunity, what they are usually doing is stalling. They're scared to death, hemming and hawing for weeks, months, and even years on end. And by then, the opportunity usually disappears. Then they rationalize the situation by saying, I was getting ready. Sure enough, but while they were getting ready, the rich guy got in, got out, and made another fortune. I know what I'm about to say may sound a little strange, considering how much I value self-responsibility. However, I do believe a certain element of what many people call luck is associated with getting rich, or, for that matter, with being successful at anything. In football, it might be the opposing team's player fumbling on your own one-yard line with less than a minute to go, allowing your team to win the game. In golf, it could be the errant shot that hits an out-of-bounds tree and bounces back onto the green just three inches from the hole. In business, how many times have you heard of a guy who plops some money down on a piece of land in the boonies, and ten years later some conglomerate decides it wants to build a shopping center or office building on it? This investor gets rich. So, was it a brilliant business move on his part, or sheer luck? My guess is that it's a bit of both. The point, however, is that no luck or anything else worthwhile will come your way unless you take some form of action. To succeed financially, you have to do something, buy something, or start something. And when you do, is it luck or is it the universe or a higher power supporting you in its miraculous ways for having the courage and commitment to go for it? As far as I'm concerned, who cares what it is? It happens. Another key principle pertinent here is that rich people focus on what they want, while poor people focus on what they don't want. Again, the universal law states, what you focus on expands. Because rich people focus on the opportunities in everything, opportunities abound for them. Their biggest problem is handling all the incredible money-making possibilities they see. On the other hand, because poor people focus on the obstacles in everything, obstacles abound for them, and their biggest problem is handling all the incredible obstacles they see. It's simple. Your field of focus determines what you find in life. Focus on opportunities, and that's what you find. Focus on obstacles, and that's what you find. I'm not saying that you don't take care of problems. Of course, handle problems as they arise in the present. But keep your eye on your goal. Keep moving toward your goal. Put your time and energy into creating what you want. When obstacles arise, handle them. Then quickly refocus on your vision. You do not make your life about solving problems. You don't spend all your time fighting fires. Those who do, move backward. You spend your time and energy in thought and deed, moving steadily forward toward your goal. Do you want some simple but extremely rare advice? Here it is. If you want to get rich, focus on making, keeping, and investing your money. If you want to be poor, focus on spending your money. You can read a thousand books and take a hundred courses on success, but it all boils down to that. Remember, what you focus on expands. 
Rich people also understand that you can never know all the information beforehand. In another of our programs, Enlightened Warrior Training, we train people to access their inner power and succeed in spite of anything. In this course, we teach a principle known as Ready, Fire, Aim. What do we mean? Get ready the best you can in as short a time as possible. Take action, then correct along the way. It's nuts to think you can know everything that may happen in the future. It's delusional to believe you can prepare for every circumstance that might someday occur and protect yourself from it. Did you know that there are no straight lines in the universe? Life doesn't travel in perfectly straight lines. It moves more like a winding river. More often than not, you can only see to the next bend, and only when you reach that next turn can you see more. The idea is to get in the game with whatever you've got from wherever you are. I call this entering the corridor. For example, years ago I was planning on opening an all-night dessert cafe in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I studied location options, the marketplace, and found out what equipment I'd need. I also researched the kinds of cakes, pies, ice creams, and coffees available. The first big problem? I got really fat. Eating my research wasn't helpful. So I asked myself, Harv, what would be the best way to study this business? Then I heard this guy named Harv, who was obviously a lot smarter than me, answer, If you really want to learn a business, get into it. You don't have to own the darn thing from day one. Get in the corridor by getting a job in the arena. You'll learn more by sweeping up a restaurant and washing dishes than by ten years of research from the outside. I told you he was a lot smarter than me. And that's what I did. I got a job at Mother Butler's Pie Shop. I wish I could tell you that they immediately recognized my superb talents and started me as CEO. But alas, somehow they just didn't see, nor did they care about my executive leadership skills. And so I began as a busboy. That's right, sweeping the floor and clearing dishes. Funny how the power of intention works, isn't it? You might think that I must really have had to swallow my pride to do this, but the truth is, I never looked at it that way. I was on a mission to learn the dessert business. I was grateful for the opportunity to learn it on someone else's ticket and make some pocket change to boot. During my tenure as the pie busboy, I spent as much time as possible shooting the doo-doo with the manager about revenues and profits, checking boxes to find out the names of the suppliers, and helping the baker at 4 a.m. to learn about equipment, ingredients, and problems that could occur. A full week went by, and I guess I was pretty good at my job, because the manager sat me down, fed me some pie, yuck, and promoted me to, drum roll please, cashier. I thought about it long and hard for exactly a nanosecond, and replied, Thanks, but no thanks. First, there was no way I could learn much being stuck behind a cash register. Second, I'd already learned what I came to learn. Mission accomplished. So that's what I mean by being in the corridor. It means entering the arena where you want to be in the future, in any capacity, to get started. This is far and away the best way to learn about a business, because you see it from the inside. Second, you can make the contacts you need, which you could never have made from the outside. Third, once you're in the corridor, many other doors of opportunity may open to you. That is, once you witness what's really going on, you may discover a niche for yourself that you hadn't recognized before. Fourth, you may find that you don't really like this field, and thank goodness you found out before you got in too deep. So which of the above happened for me? By the time I was done with Mother Butler's, I couldn't stand the smell or sight of pie. Second, the baker quit the day after I left, phoned me, and explained that he had just found out about a hot new piece of exercise equipment known as gravity guidance inversion boots. You may have seen Richard Gere hang upside down in these in the movie American Gigolo, and wanted to know if I was interested in looking at them. I checked things out and decided the boots were dynamite, but he wasn't, so I got involved on my own. I began selling the boots to sporting goods and department stores. I noticed these retail outlets all had one thing in common, crummy exercise equipment. My brain bells went berserk. Opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Funny how things happen. This was my first experience selling exercise equipment, which eventually led me to opening one of the first retail fitness stores in North America and making my very first million. And to think, it all started with me being a busboy at Mother Butler's Pies Shop. The moral is simple. 
get in the corridor. You never know what doors will open unto you. I have a motto. Action always beats inaction. Rich people get started. They trust that once they get in the game, they can make intelligent decisions in the present moment, make corrections and adjust their sales along the way. Poor people don't trust in themselves or their abilities, so they believe they have to know everything in advance, which is virtually impossible. Meanwhile, they don't do squat. In the end, with their positive, ready-fire-aim attitude, rich people take action and usually win. In the end, by telling themselves, I'm not doing anything until I've identified every possible problem and know exactly what to do about it, poor people never take action and therefore always lose. Rich people see an opportunity, jump on it, and get even richer. As for poor people, they're still preparing. Declarations Place your hand on your heart and say, I focus on opportunities over obstacles. I get ready, I fire, I aim. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. I remember knocking on a stunningly carved wooden door that was at least 20 feet high. The mom opened it up and with the friendliest voice I'd ever heard said, Harv, it's so great to meet you. Come on in. I was a bit bewildered as she poured me some iced tea and got me a bowl of fruit. What's the catch? My skeptical mind kept wanting to know. Then her husband came in from playing with his kids in the pool. He was even friendlier. Harv, we're so happy to have you in the neighborhood. You have to come to our barbecue tonight with the rest of your family. We'll introduce you to everybody, and we're not taking no for an answer. By the way, do you golf? I'm playing tomorrow at the club. Why don't you come as my guest? By now, I was in shock. What happened to the snobs I was sure I was going to meet? I left and went back home to tell my wife we were going to the barbecue. Oh my, she said. What will I wear? No, honey, you don't understand, I said. These people are incredibly nice and totally informal. Just be who you are. We went and that evening met some of the warmest, kindest, most generous, most loving people of our lives. At one point, the conversation shifted to a charity drive that one of the guests was heading up. One after another, the checkbooks came out. I couldn't believe it. I was actually watching a lineup to give this woman money. But each check came with a catch. The agreement was that there would be reciprocity and that the woman would support the charity the donor was involved in. That's right. To a T, every person there either headed up or was a major player in a charity. Our friends who had invited us were involved in several. In fact, each year they made it their goal to be the single largest donor in the entire city to the Children's Hospital Fund. They not only gave tens of thousands of dollars themselves, but every year they organized a dinner gala that raised hundreds of thousands more. Then there was the vain doctor. We became quite close with his family too. He was among the top varicose vein doctors in the world and made a fortune, somewhere in the range of 5,000 to 10,000 per surgery, doing four or five surgeries per day. I bring him up because every Tuesday was free day when he would do surgeries on people in the city who couldn't afford to pay. On this day, he would work from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., doing as many as 10 surgeries all for free. On top of this, he headed up his own organization whose mission was to get other doctors to do free days for people in their communities too. Needless to say, my old conditioned belief that rich people were greedy snobs dissipated in the light of reality. Now I know the opposite is true. In my experience, the richest people I know are the nicest people I know. They are also the most generous. Not to say that people who aren't rich aren't nice or generous but I can safely say the idea that all rich people are somehow bad is nothing more than ignorance. The fact is, resenting the rich is one of the surest ways to stay broke. We are creatures of habit, and to overcome this or any other habit we need to practice. Instead of resenting rich people, I want you to practice admiring rich people. I want you to practice blessing rich people, and I want you to practice loving rich people. That way, unconsciously, you know that when you become rich, other people will admire you, bless you, and love you instead of resent the heck out of you the way you might do them now. One of the philosophies I live by comes from ancient Huna wisdom, the original teachings of the Hawaiian elders. It goes like this, bless that which you want. If you see a person with a beautiful home, bless that person and bless that home. If you see a person with a beautiful car, bless that person and bless that car. If you see a person with a loving family, 
bless that person and bless that family. If you see a person with a beautiful body, bless that person and bless their body. The point is, if you resent what people have in any way, shape or form, you can never have it. Regardless, if you see a person in a gorgeous black jaguar with the sunroof open, don't throw beer cans at it. Declarations Place your hand on your heart and say, I admire rich people. I bless rich people. I love rich people. And I'm going to be one of those rich people too. Touch your head and say, I have a millionaire mind. Millionaire mind actions. 1. Practice the Huna philosophy, bless that which you want. Drive around or buy magazines. Look at beautiful homes, gorgeous cars, and read about successful businesses. Whatever you see that you like, bless it, and bless the owners or the people involved. 2. Write and send a short letter or email to someone you know of, not necessarily personally, who is highly successful in any arena, telling them how much you admire and honor them for their achievements. Wealth File Number 7 Rich people associate with positive, successful people. Poor people associate with negative or unsuccessful people. Successful people look at other successful people as a means to motivate themselves. They see other successful people as models to learn from. They say to themselves, if they can do it, I can do it. As I mentioned earlier, modeling is one of the primary ways that people learn. Rich people are grateful that others have succeeded before them so that they now have a blueprint to follow that will make it easier to attain their own success. Why reinvent the wheel? There are proven methods for success that work for virtually everyone who applies them. Consequently, the fastest and easiest way to create wealth is to learn exactly how rich people who are masters of money play the game. The goal is to simply model their inner and outer strategies. It just makes sense. If you take the exact same actions and have the exact same mindset, chances are you will get the exact same results. That's what I did, and that's what this entire book is about. Contrary to the rich, when poor people hear about other people's success, they often judge them, criticize them, mock them, and try to pull them down to their own level. How many of you know people like this? How many of you know family members like this? The question is, how can you possibly learn from or be inspired by someone you put down? Whenever I'm introduced to an extremely rich person, I create a way to get together with them. I want to talk to them, learn how they think, exchange contacts, and if we have other things in common, possibly become personal friends with them. By the way, if you think I'm wrong for preferring to be friends with rich people, perhaps you'd rather I pick friends who are broke? I don't think so. As I've mentioned before, Energy is contagious, and I have no interest in subjecting myself to theirs. I was recently doing a radio interview, and a woman called in with an excellent question. What do I do if I'm positive and want to grow, but my husband is a downer? Do I leave him? Do I try and get him to change? What? I hear this question at least a hundred times a week when I'm teaching our courses. Almost everyone asks the same question. What if the people I'm closest to aren't into personal growth and even put me down for it? Here's the answer I gave the woman on the call, what I tell people at our courses, and what I'm suggesting to you. First, don't bother trying to get negative people to change or come to the course. That's not your job. Your job is to use what you've learned to better yourself and your life. Be the model. Be successful. Be happy. Then maybe, and I stress maybe, they'll see the light in you and want some of it. If you say you're not worthy, you're not. Either way, you will live into your story. This is so critical, I'm going to repeat that again. You will live into your story. It's that simple. So why would people do this to themselves? Why would people make up the story that they're not worthy? It's just the nature of the human mind, the protective part of us that's always looking for what's wrong. Ever notice that a squirrel doesn't worry about these things? Can you imagine a squirrel saying, I'm not going to collect many nuts this year to prepare for winter because I'm not worthy. Doubtful, because these low intelligence creatures would never do that to themselves. Only the most evolved creature on the planet, the human being, has the ability to limit itself like this. One of my own sayings is, 
If a hundred foot oak tree had the mind of a human, it would only grow to be 10 feet tall. So here's my suggestion. Since it's a lot easier to change your story than your worthiness, instead of worrying about changing your worthiness, change your story. It's a lot faster and cheaper. Simply make up a new and much more supportive story and live into that. Oh, but I couldn't do that, you say. I'm not qualified to decide that I'm worthy. That has to come from someone else. Sorry, I say, that's not quite accurate. Which is a nice way of saying bull poo. It wouldn't make a difference what anyone says or said in the past, because you have to believe it and buy into it for it to have any effect, and that can't come from anyone else but you. But just to make you feel better, let's play the game and I'll do for you what I do for thousands of participants at the Millionaire Mind Intensive Seminar. I will personally anoint you. This is a special ceremony, so I'm going to ask you to eliminate any distractions right now. Stop munching, stop talking on the phone, stop whatever you're doing. Men, if you like, you can change into a suit and tie, although a tuxedo would be best. Women, a formal evening gown and heels would be perfect. And if you don't have anything that's classy or new enough, this would definitely be an occasion to go buy yourself a brand new dress. Designer label preferred. If you're all ready, let's begin. Please kneel down on one knee and bow your head in respect. Ready? Here goes. By the power invested in me, I hereby anoint you as worthy from now until forevermore. Okay, we're done. You can stand up now and hold your head high because you're finally worthy. Here's some sage advice. Stop buying into that worthiness or unworthiness crap and start taking the actions you need to take to get rich. The second major reason most people have a problem with receiving is that they have bought into the adage, it's better to give than to receive. Let me put this as elegantly as possible. What a crock. That statement is total hogwash. And in case you haven't noticed, it's usually propagated by people and groups who want you to give and them to receive. The whole idea is ludicrous. What's better, hot or cold, big or small, left or right, in or out? Giving and receiving are two sides of the same coin. Whoever decided that it is better to give than to receive was simply bad at math. For every giver, there must be a receiver. And for every receiver, there must be a giver. Think about it. How could you give if there weren't someone or something there to receive? Both have to be in perfect balance to work one to one, 50-50. And since giving and receiving must always equal each other, they must also be equal in importance. Besides, how does it feel to give? Most of us would agree that giving feels wonderful and fulfilling. Conversely, how does it feel when you want to give and the other person isn't willing to receive? Most of us would agree that it feels terrible. So know this. If you are not willing to receive, then you are ripping off those who want to give to you. You are actually denying them the joy and pleasure that comes from giving. Instead, they feel lousy. Why? Again, everything is energy. And when you want to give but can't, that energy cannot be expressed and gets stuck in you. That stuck energy then turns into negative emotions. To make matters worse, when you are not willing to fully receive, you are training the universe not to give to you. It's simple. If you aren't willing to receive your share, it will go to someone else who is. That's one of the reasons the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Not because they're any more worthy, but because they are willing to receive while most poor people are not. I learned this lesson in a big way while camping by myself in the forest. In preparation for my two-day sojourn, I made what's called a lean-to. This means tying the top part of a tarp to a tree and then fastening the bottom to the ground to create a 45-degree roof over my head when I slept. Thank goodness I prepared this mini condo because it rained all night. When I came out of my shelter that morning, I noticed how dry I and everything else under the tarp was. At the same time, however, I couldn't help but notice this unusually deep puddle that had collected at the bottom of the tarp. All of a sudden, I heard this inner voice say to me, Nature is totally abundant, but not discriminating. When the rain falls, it has to go somewhere. 
If one part is dry, another part will be doubly wet. As I stood over the puddle, I realized this is exactly the way it works with money. There's plenty of it, trillions and trillions of dollars floating around. It's indefinite abundance, and it has to go somewhere. The deal is this. If somebody isn't willing to receive his or her share, it must go to whoever will.